All right. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Gardening for Beginners, week three of our four week course. And I'm Louise, and I'm going to introduce the class today. And uh, our topic is choosing plants and keeping them safe. So this week, we're going to cover 10 easy plants to grow to kind of give people something to start with. Um, we're going to talk a lot about shopping for plants and seeds, starting plants from seeds, and um, a lot about pests. That includes the rats and squirrels everyone's been asking about, and weeds. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We didn't have any lingering questions from last week, so I don't have anything to say about that. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of class today. And then I just wanna review quickly last week's class. Last week, we talked about how plants grow. Remember that plants grow from the tips, from the top of the tree, from the side, from the tip of the tomato branches, they grow from the tips not from the, the middle of the trunk, right? So the middle of the trunk stays where it is and the plant grows up from there. Uh, so how plants grow. And Bob also talked quite a bit about pollination and how plants reproduce. We also talked about types of plants. Remember we have annuals, perennials, and their growth habits, um, especially deciduous plants that lose their leaves and evergreen plants that keep their leaves or needles all year round. We talked about researching plants, how to learn about the plants that you're interested in growing. And in particular, we wanted you to remember that when you go on the internet, most of the material you'll see about plants will be related to Eastern United States or even the United Kingdom or Europe. So when you Google or search for plant information online, it's really helpful to say Santa Clara County or California or zone, whatever your zone is in your search to make sure you get really good specific information for your area. Also, you can add UCANR to your search or .edu or .org to get sites that are less commercial, more educational and more research-based. We talked a little bit about garden design and the most important things to remember there are to group plants according to their needs. So the plants that like full sun should be in the same part of the garden. The plants that like a lot of water should be in the same part of the garden, that sort of thing. And then also when you're designing your garden, consider the size that that plant will be at maturity. So draw circles on your design that show how big that plant is going to be when it's grown up so that you give your plants plenty of space. So those are the things we talked about last week. And now we are going to look at the seedlings and um, Paul is going to review the scavenger hunt. So let's see how Susan came along with her seedlings. Okay, let me just pull the screen down here so you can see those seedlings. If you recall, two weeks ago, I planted the radish seeds and here they are. They are still, in most cases, still only showing their cotyledons. Only one of them here has got the start of its first true leaf. So they are really taking their time. Now in the summertime, probably these would be far more advanced by the second week. But it's still winter, and even though the weather is warm, it's cold at night, and so these are pretty slow in their growth. They are there, and next week, I think next week, we'll just take a few of these out that are crowding the others. So I'm going to let them grow until they get their first true leaves, though. And over here are the sugar snap peas. If you recall last week, only one of them had surfaced. Now we have two which have completely surfaced and one here, which is just starting to come above the surface of the soil. So they are progressing slowly as well, but the 
radishes that would normally have grown a little bit faster in a different um, temperature, climate, uh, different time of year. But that, I don't know if you could see it or not, but I've had them on a ledge out in my garden and they're starting to reach for the sun. So I'm going to have to find a sunnier location for them. Remember, that was one of the things we talked about earlier. The plants will reach for the sun if they're not getting a sufficient amount. So maybe we could go on to Paul, who's going to be talking about the scavenger hunt you did last week. All right. So the job one is to figure out what your uh, climate zone is. Here's an example, 10A for Mountain View. Yours will probably be different. And even within the same zone, zip code, you might see variations. There is a really good interactive site um, in the fed.us domain that you can actually zoom into the map and see all the variations there. Okay, so what bird is attracted to pineapple and guava? So here we've got the description of a pineapple and guava, and in that text, it tells us that it attracts hummingbirds. So hopefully you got to find an interesting garden design or planting plan and um, got some notes from that. These are just jumping off ideas and hopefully you can spend a bit of time investigating things that you found particularly interesting. So number four was a task to get used to using calscape.org. Um, this is pretty, pretty straightforward. The seaside daily is an Aragon carcass. And then similarly, exploring the select tree on Cal Poly, uh, there's a Monroe vine maple and a red osier dogwood as small deciduous trees native to our state. Finally, a vegetable to grow in the fall, winter or spring. Um, probably found a bunch of these. Uh, I would highly recommend trying bok choy. It's super easy. It's um, very prolific and goes all the way through fall. And now Susan is gonna tell us about 10 easy plants. Okay, you're probably quite interested in getting started in your garden. So what if we had 10 easy plants that you could choose from to get that garden going? Plants that do well in our climate and that don't require a tremendous amount of care or sophisticated care. The first one is the rosemary plant. Now the rosemary plant does thrive in full sun. As we saw in the very first class, it was one of the plants that we had looked at. It can tolerate some shade, it really prefers full sun. It doesn't need a lot of water once it's established. It has lovely blue or purple flowers and you can see some of them on this slide. They're actually in bloom right now. So lovely flowers in the late winter, early spring. And it does attract some nice beneficial insects as well. You could get it as a ground cover plant, a low and prostrate growing plant, or you could get it as a tall growing plant. Um, in either case, it has good uses in the kitchen. So if you like to cook rosemary. This is a great plant to have not only for the beauty of it, but because you can cook with it. A second plant, easy to grow, also good in the kitchen, chives. Now chives are um, a plant that will grow um, every year. Um, it will send up those thin green oniony shoots and if you let the shoots grow for a length of time you'll get those lovely blossoms on the top. Both the shoot and the blossom are good eating. Um, the blossoms you could put throw in your salad for um, uh, just a colorful bit of uh, vegetable in your salad. Uh, they require average garden soil. Um, they prefer full sun. They will take a little shade and they were uh, like regular water. Um, my chives tend to go dormant in the winter time and I cut them back. They don't look very nice and they start growing again late winter. Might have already started to grow. But 
chives are a good easy one. Another easy plant is lettuce. Uh, lettuce, you could either start from a seed or from a transplant from one of the nursery six packs. Uh, prefers a regular garden soil. Again, uh, more sun than shade and a fair amount of water. Um, lettuce is primarily water, so it's going to need a lot of water in your garden. It may go partially, um, it may tend to go to seed in the summer months uh, when it gets too hot. So I would suggest that we grow this from the autumn through the spring in our climate. It's easier to grow leaf lettuces than it is to grow head lettuces like the iceberg lettuce that you see in the store or like a romaine lettuce. So a leaf lettuce is a great starter plant. Tomatoes. Everybody loves tomatoes, probably the most popular plant most people grow in their garden. Um, these particular tomatoes in this bowl are the little ones, the little gold ones are either sun sugar or sun gold cherry tomatoes. The green ones are a green zebra. Both the yellow ones and the green ones are ripe and ready to go right now. So the green one is green on the exterior and on the interior, but it is a tasty tomato. You'll find that you, if you're going to go buy these in a nursery, uh, the nurseries start to stock them far in advance of the time that you put them in the garden. I was in the nursery just this week and I saw that they already started to have six packs of tomato plants. Um, it's too early to put them out. You want to um, baby them along in outside if you want. Um, you can actually take the six packs start transplanting them up in size to bigger container and bigger container and then bigger container and then transplant them out into the soil or you could just wait until our soil gets a little bit warmer. Generally around April is a good time to put them out. You want to just be careful that you don't buy them when they are too mature. Right now they're just fine. Another nice colorful plant to have in your garden is either known easier as the viola or pansy. So they're both in the same family, the family of viola. Uh, pansy has a bigger flower, viola has a smaller flower. They both come uh, from transplants in the nursery. It's a lot easier to grow them as transplants than to try and start as seeds. Um, they're best from autumn through summer. They are an annual sometimes will last as a for a second year if the conditions are right they should be treated as if they were an annual don't, don't expect them to come back the second year or to last for two years they require regular garden soil and sun and lots and lots of moisture so they are not a drought tolerant plant at all this plant is the sunflower um you know it's like something you could do as Planting a sunflower seed, probably not one of the ones that's already roasted, but a fresh sunflower seed. You can buy sunflower plants in the nursery. Um, generally, they want full sun, uh, average garden soil, and they don't use a lot of water. So that's a good plant to have in a draw year. Uh, you come in the really tall varieties, the ones that get 12 foot tall with a seed head that could be a foot across that has lots of delicious seeds in it. Birds love the seeds, rats love the seeds, etc. cetera. Um, or you can get a smaller one like teddy bear sunflower that's maybe about a foot tall. Uh, very attractive in the garden. They, and they attract, attract the nice groups of goldfinches sometimes. Another plant is the salvia. Um, salvia is, it has two different varieties that you're probably familiar with. One on the left is we call culinary sage, or it's the sage you cook with, it's part of the salvia family. And the one on the right is the one that we have as a flowering plant in our garden. This one is hot lips, white on the top and the red on the bottom. Um, the flowering salvia comes in all kinds of different colors. These are perennials, so you will have them in your garden for quite a while. They require average garden soil, they like a lot of sun, but they don't need a lot of water once they're established. So another good plant for a low water use garden. Antana, another bright, colorful plant to have in your garden. 
comes in a variety of colors. And you can see that we've got some that are yellow and orange, some purples. There are some red ones. It's uh, either a bush or it's come in a trailing form. Again, full sun with some part shade, um, low water, and it is a perennial as well. California fuchsia. This is a native to California. It also is a low water plant, a perennial. It likes uh, full sun. We'll take some shade. Um, really a low water usage plant once it's um, established. So it's gonna have the red flowers um, and the foliage will either be sort of green or silvery. It blooms from the summer through the fall. Um, it tolerates heat and drought. I think the flowers are a very attractive shape for hummingbirds. So this is a good plant to use if you want to attract hummingbirds into your garden. And our final of the 10 easy plants is the citrus. So here's our, this is our first tree. Um, it needs full sun if you're going to get the sweetest fruit off of the tree. So again, full sun, six to eight hours of sun. Uh, does need occasional water. It tends to get the greatest amount of water in the winter time when we're having our rainy season. In a year like this and a year like last year, um, I've been watering my established citrus trees because we're not getting the winter rain, which is what they need in order to thrive. Um, for example, my neighbor's tree has not been watered in a full year because the house was empty and the citrus tree looks absolutely terrible after two years of no winter water and no summer water. So it does need some water, not a lot of water. Citrus can be oranges, lemons, fruits, kumquats, et cetera. Um, the trees are very decorative and some will hold on to their fruit for several months. Some need to be harvested fairly quickly. Uh, some can even be grown in pots, very successfully in pots. Um, think of the orangerie at the uh, Palace of Versailles in France. It's a very large orangery because orange uh, citrus trees do not do well in the climate of France. It's too cold in the winter. Okay, so now you learned in our earlier classes about preparing the soil for your garden in anticipation of planting it. And we've talked a bit about how you're going to care for your plants. So you're going to go shopping for plants. And you could either go shopping for plants as plants themselves, or you could go shopping for plants as seeds. And Bob's going to talk a little bit more about plants as seeds in the next part of our talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about nurseries. Now, as master gardeners, we can't recommend a particular nursery or, um, or retail source for plants. But these are some of the ones that are in our area. We've got general plant nurseries. Um, the Dijon Agami, Central Wholesale. We have some specialty nurseries as well. There are online resources for um, both plants and seeds. And then, of course, we have big box stores. I've listed some of these up here, but are there nurseries that you frequent? Are there ones that we should let everybody else know about? You've got some, and you want to put them in the chat? That would be great. We can share them with the other members of our class. Um, in our general plant nurseries, you're going to find a lot of the typical annuals, perennials, etc. Our specialty nurseries are sometimes limited to one particular variety of plant. A native is native plants to this area. Nola's Irish Garden up in the hills of San Jose only has irises. Um, in the online sources, you've got Annie's Annuals, which has a retail store plus their online presence. And um, Etsy, amazingly, has a large number of plants, plants, sometimes ones you cannot find in our um, local stores. So there's a variety of things for you to <laughs> look for. Um, and due to the increase of interest in home gardening, you might find that some of the plants that you're looking for or that pique your interest are not available. You might have to go to a couple of to find them. They've sold out. No. Persistence pays off. Now, nurseries 
uh, will arrange their plants in ways to help you find the plants. They'll put annuals together, perennials together, shrubs, trees, etc. And some nurseries will actually even group them into the um, area where the plants originate. So in this nursery, you'll see that they've got some plants from New Zealand, and then a little further on, there are plants from the Mediterranean. So if you're looking for plants that are similar to our variety, our, our climate, such as our Mediterranean climate, well, you can see that they've got some organized there. One nice thing about seeing these plants in person in a, a description like this is that you can mentally group them together. I think that's a good way of just viewing plants as a whole to help you choose some of the plants that you might want to have. You can also see that None of these plants are under shade cloth. So all these plants in this particular photo are sun lovers. Okay, so when you get to the plant, as Denise had pointed out earlier, you're gonna to wanna to read that plant label. Uh, the colors don't mean anything. But what they're going to tell you is they're going to give you the common name of the plant, Hopefully they're going to give you the Latin name of the plant. They give you the final size when the plant is completely grown. Is, it, is this little sprout going to be a two by two inch plant or is it going to be a two by two plant? Um, and it's going to hopefully give you something about the water requirements and the sun and shade requirements. So some nursery signage can be very good. This nursery wants you to be successful with your $169.95 or from Prove Fire Lemon Tree. This tree is coming to you in a 10 gallon pot. And so they're going to tell you a lot about this plant so that you have success with it. They're telling you what it likes, how it produces its fruit. This one says it often bears fruit in the first year. Um, it's sun loving and that kind of soil it likes, etc want you to have success. You don't have to buy a 10 gallon pot of a tree. You can actually buy these in one gallons at a much more reduced price. This one is going to produce fruit probably as soon as you put it in the ground. It might even have fruit on it right now. But because it's in a 10 gallon pot, you know it is grown up to that size. It's not being squished into that pot, hopefully. So there is that 10 gallon pot. You're also gonna encounter containers that are of different sizes. Most annuals come in six packs or in four packs. Sometimes they'll come in single plant containers. Uh, the single plant containers will arrange um, in size from that little tiny one, which is mostly for a small succulent all the way to a larger one. Um, they'll also come in one gallon sizes through five gallon sizes. Generally, perennials are going to come into the gallon size containers. What you buy um, is dictated more by what the nursery has available and whether it's an annual or perennial or tree or shrub. If you want to have a bigger plant, you can buy a, a larger uh, five gallon size. Uh, if you're buying a tree or a bush, um, again, you have all different sizes. So when, you've got, when you're in the nursery and you're buying your plants, you really want to inspect the roots of the plant. How do you do this? Well, gently, you turn the pot over and pop out one of the cells and take a look at the root structure. Or and you do it gently. You don't want the, the plant to fall out of the pot. You don't want the soil to fall out. You know, this is a way you could tell. This particular plant looks really good. Uh, Roots are white, they're not circling around the plant. The soil is held in a compact mass. This looks like a good plant to buy. This does not look like a good plant to buy. There are too many of them in the pots, overgrown. The bottom leaves are dying. It's full of blooms, looks like the blooms are stressing. I would not buy this. I turned it over. This is what it looked like on the bottom. This is definitely a plant that has been in this container for far too long. So I would certainly avoid a plant like this. 
And now Bob's going to be talking about seeds. Okay. So with all these nurseries around here that uh, Susan just talked about, why would you want to grow a plant from seed when all these seedlings are there? So uh, like many uh, answers in, uh, in life and uh, agriculture, it depends. Uh, so what follows in the next slide, I'll, I'll give you some reasons uh, why, do, why you want to grow from seeds. And sometimes maybe it's not such a good idea. So, you know, some plants won't transplant well, uh, root vegetables is one, and others are, are made for seeding. So let's, let's go there with the list here. Okay, it's not always cheaper, uh, but if you need a lot of plants, um, it, it, it is considerably cheaper. You can imagine, I, I uh, grow quite a few tomato plants, seedlings, and distribute them to friends and charities and uh, buying the seedlings would be very expensive. So, so I grow a lot of seedlings. It's easier to get one of each as opposed to 15 or 20 of them. So if you just need one or two, then maybe a, a seed is where you wanna go. Uh, you'll find uh, seeds in catalogs that are available at local nurseries. And, and we'll show you an example of that. Usually they're in these turnstiles or uh, kind of rotisserie trays or whatever. And that's not a bad place to buy them in, in the nurseries. Uh, in some cases, uh, the garden will have uh, conditions, growing conditions that, that are endemic to your area. Uh, a good example here is uh, about three years ago in one of my raised beds, actually two of them to be exact, I was growing tomatoes and they were all uh, contaminated with Bruticillium wilt. And so I had to pull them all up. So what I did then is uh, still during the summer, you, uh, you wet, the, wet the, the soil, you put clear plastic in it and you solarize. And then uh, after that in the fall, I, I, grow, I grew some broccoli and I've been doing that every fall because that has a way of minimizing the pathogens. And after three years, I will now plant tomatoes in that bed, but I will look for disease resistant tomatoes, specifically uh, Bruticillium wilt. And you'll see when you go to a, a, a tag, there's usually sometimes it will have a VFN, which is Verticillium fusarium or nematode resistant. So that's what I'm saying is if you've got some certain type of diseases in your area or maybe less sun, uh, you can choose the tomato, which is more uh, suitable for that area. And usually you can go to a a seed catalog and find that. Uh, moving along, do you want to grow something that is best grown from seeds? Uh, and carrots, you don't want to buy them in six packs. And, and, and this applies to a lot of root vegetables, be it carrots, be it parsnips or radishes, uh, you're better off with, with a seed. And, and corn's another example, though it's not a root. Uh, there are some easier direct seeding uh, seeds uh, being squash, peas, and beans. When it gets warm enough, you just poke them in the in the in the dirt soil, and uh, hopefully you'll you'll have success. Uh, and finally, uh, you know you can get a jump start. You can start the seeds ahead of time, and uh, and then you know nurture them. And then when it's time to plant the in, in you know like April fifteenth is the time I put mine in. Uh, you can have a, a a more mature plant, and it'll really take off. So those are some of the the examples. Uh, where to get seeds? Well, I'd mentioned the nurseries. What you see here on the left, there's usually, like I said, a little uh, aisle that'll have uh, turnsoles or whatever with, uh, with seeds. And you wanna make sure that these are inside because seeds keep better when they don't have a lot of humidity or heat. So that's a, a first good place to find seeds in the nurseries. They'll all have these racks. Uh, and the other one is catalog. And we'll talk a little bit about that. On uh, we'll show you some catalogs and where you can get them. Uh, as uh, Louise had mentioned, or like Susan mentioned, we're not going to recommend any uh, specific catalog, but I will talk about certain catalogs are more geared towards different types of gardeners. So here we are, burpee. Let's talk about the burpee. They're kind of the you know the, the grill in the room as far as uh, uh, catalogs, and that's a good place to start. Uh, they're kind of for like the home gardener. Uh, so I, I get the catalog uh, every year 
Uh, it's one of the better days in the year uh, when I get my seed catalog, but we'll talk about a little bit that in another slide. Reamer seeds, I, I use them for uh, disease resistant plants. They seem to have a, a good selection. So again, that's a specific need. Renee's garden, uh, I get my uh, Trombetta di Albanga, which is a climbing vining squash and they're local. So, you know, that, that, that appeals to me. Tomato fest, these are organic. I think they're based in Monterey or Carmel. So I've gotten a lot of organic tomato seedlings from them. Johnny's, Johnny's is kind of geared towards the, the small farmer. And there is a lot of very detailed information there. Unlike burpee, which is more for the home gardener, Johnny's is for the, for the, the uh, small farmer. So anyway, they're catering to a, a different uh, type of farm. And then the last one is the Baker Creek heirlooms. I, I can't say I've, I've uh, dealt with them, but uh, that was recommended by one of the master gardeners. So anyway, that's kind of the shopping for seeds. Uh, here's the, uh, the burpee catalog. Here's what I like to do. Uh, Every year I'll get this and I want to go to, if you can see it up, upper right, the Burpee 2021 new and favorites. That's one of the advantages of the seeds. You can get a seed that none of your neighbors has, or at least not yet. So I'll look at this catalog and I say, oh, that's an interesting tomato and nobody else will have that. So gee, maybe I want to grow that. And also a squash, a squash, this is different. Uh, nobody else has that. that, that appeals to me, I'll try that. It's all about experimentation. And peppers, uh, you know, I, I've been growing more peppers these days. So anyway, I look at this and say, this is gonna be fun, I'm gonna do this. Okay, so this is what my, uh, my seed factory looks like uh, last year. Uh, and, if you do grow things from seed, uh, do it in small scale, in small steps. So I've taken a lot of small steps to get where I am right now. So every year I uh, probably germinate uh, and give away to, like I said, to friends and, and charities, probably closer to 400 uh, seedlings. And what I have is what you see here, it's a south facing window. I have a little plastic, two, two of them, two shelf greenhouses. I have germination mats, which they heat them up. I have a fan, which puts pressure on uh, them and, and minimizes the foliar diseases. And I'll also have uh, some grow lights. So uh, this is something I have arrived at after years and years. Don't try this your first year, please. Uh, because growing seedlings, it's a bit like, uh, it takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of patience. And it's not unlike caring for a newborn or a new puppy. Uh, it, it's very gratifying watching them grow, uh, but uh, you'll also have some disappointments with seedlings when uh, there's some diseases they're just subject to. So anyway, if you are going to do some seedlings, uh, start out slowly, but it is so gratifying when I can look at this and say, you know, these started from seeds because you can look at a tomato seed and it is so small and at the end of the season, it's this monstrous seven foot plant with lots of wonderful tomatoes. So that's, uh, that's, the, that's the seedling story. So Paul, do you wanna talk about pest management? Great, thanks Bob. Uh, we're gonna keep learning more about planting smaller and larger plants next week in uh, the final week. All right, so turns out that there's more to gardening than, than just providing an excellent growth environment. There's a bunch of these pesky pets ready to pounce on your delicious produce. So what are we gonna do about that? Well, first of all, we have to know what we're up against and how to maintain or control all these little adversaries. So this is actually a pretty big topic. Um, so this is more of a, Kind of a broad introduction and um, sense of what's out there and what's possible and ultimately i'm going to leave you with a uh, an amazing tool uh, the integrated pest management site from uh, uc and there'll be uh, some pretty fun homework to to do to work on with that okay well what is a weed it's quite an interesting idea to think how is a weed different from a plant? 
Well, if you look at that photo, it might be difficult to see because there's so many weeds. There's actually some onions in there, but they've been really crowded out by these other plants. So in a sense, a weed is, is, is obviously just another plant, but it's, it's a plant that you don't want there. Uh, you'd rather have all the resources that you're putting into this garden, whether it's sunlight or um, good soil or compost or even fertilizer. Uh, you want your onions to be using that rather than the weeds. Obviously, there's a competition between the two. So there's a couple of different types of weeds broadly, uh, just as there are regular plants. We've got annual weeds and perennial weeds. So the annuals are the ones that uh, grow from seed. One year they, they bloom, they spread seed, and then they die. And then the next year, those seeds that are in the ground start the cycle all, all over again. And then the perennials exist uh, in a continuous state throughout the year, but just in a different, um, they're either dormant in the roots or they're, they're flowering and blooming and providing seeds. The perennials are, can be pretty difficult. They can create astonishingly deep roots. I mean, like 10 feet um, and very, very hard to get, get rid of, but it is possible. Okay, so what are, the, what are the essentials in weed control? Well, I mean, it's, it's easy to say, but it's sometimes difficult to do, but do your very best not to let a weed go to seed. These seeds can live in the ground um, dormant for a very, very long time, like years and years. And once, once they're there, um, you've kind of got uh, a long-term problem. So ideally, Get them as early as you can. As soon as you see them popping up, pluck them out of the ground before they can uh, get their roots too far down and, and bloom. Uh, so there's a bunch of suggestions there that um, make a lot of sense in terms of catching them early. Uh, hoe, pull them out, remove the roots as well. Um, if you think about the mulch uh, we talked about before, one of the great things about mulch is if the weed starts to root in mulch, it's very, very easy to pull it out because the mulch is like a, it's not a, it's not a dense uh, substance like clay soil. It's very, it's loose and fluffy. So oftentimes it's, if you get the weed before it actually gets into the, the soil beneath the mulch, you can just pluck it right out and you get everything, the, the roots and roots and all. So that's the perfect environment. So that's actually yet another reason why you should use that magic mulch. So there are pests that move around and these ones have a backbone. Uh, you've got all the rodents like uh, rats and gophers and squirrels. And then of course there's, there's birds. Birds will come and pluck seeds and um, seedlings. The rats and gophers will, uh, and moles will eat roots as well um, from un underneath. I have uh, planted out whole beds full of se pea seedlings and bean seedlings and had them all get destroyed literally overnight uh, by a couple of local neighborhood rabbits. So it's, it's pretty frustrating, <laughs> and, but there are ways of dealing with them. One of them is covering these vulnerable seedlings and small, when the plants are small, they're particularly susceptible to getting uh, eaten by these various pests. So one of the super easy things is like a little container for strawberries. Uh, you're familiar with those little plastic uh, baskets. You can turn those over and use it to protect the seedling. And you, you're really doing this just long enough for it to get established and develop some of its own, its own strength. Plastic milk jugs are a, another decent option. They let the light through, but also uh, provide a, a nice kind of moist environment and protect against pests. So there's something called hardware cloth. Obviously it's not fabric. Uh, this is a galvanized 
metal that resists corrosion and pests. So there's a couple of examples of using hardware cloth as uh, a cage that will go over a larger area of vegetables. And then on the right, if you have a raised bed and you know that you have gophers and subterranean pests, you can line you can line the bottom of your hardware cloth, staple it in, and that will successfully prevent animals from coming up uh, beneath. So there are different types of hardware cloth. Um, you can get half inch, you can get quarter inch. Um, half is usually fine. Stuff, unfortunately, is, uh, is not cheap, but it is pretty effective. So continuing the hardware cloth, there is something called a gopher basket. And this is, this is the uh, hardware cloth wrapped around into what looks like a pot. And you can see the idea is it's going to protect the roots of the, uh, of the plant while it's growing. This works pretty well, um, but there are some caveats. Well, the first one is this hardware cloth is not cheap. I did a, a front yard uh, with California natives, and I just learned about gopher pots. And I said, hey, you know, how about we put them all in pots? And the guy that was doing the, the buy said, yeah, you can, but you're going to pay close to twice as much. So I was like, yeah, well, let me make sure that I have gophers before I spend another thousand dollars on this. The other disadvantage is if you look on the right, you can see the roots can start to circle inside the pots. They don't just automatically go through. So if your plant is likely to be significantly bigger than the, the uh, gopher pot, uh, sorry, the, the, the pot that you see may not be appropriate. Like for example, if you have a say manzanita, that's going to have a pretty significant root structure and that's going to get in the way of, um, the, the, the gopher pot's going to get in the way of that. Snails and slugs. Well, you don't tend to see so many of them now because there's less water coming out of the sky. But when you do, there are quite a few different ways of dealing with these. Um, one is to just simply pick them out at night. Uh, they come out at night, uh, especially after rains. And you can just pick them up and um, dispose of them that way. Uh, there are some traps that are pretty effective. Here on the bottom right is something called a beer trap. So this is essentially a sweet, fragrant liquid that they are attracted to. You can put it in a small bowl and recess it slightly into the ground and they essentially get attracted and then drown in it. Another one is uh, making a, uh, an environment that is attractive to them as well. There's moist, uh, darker board that you see on the right. If you want to bait, um, obviously try to use the least toxic that you can find. Iron phosphate's considered pretty good. Uh, Sluggo is a brand that most people are familiar with. And the idea here is you want to sprinkle it around plants on moist soil. Try not to make trails or um, big piles. It's not really necessary. And you want to use as little as you can. Aphids. These are tiny little animals that will feed on the plant's juices and they, they suck it out and they stress the plant. So the reason, again, we're going back to competition for resources. Uh, you'd rather that energy and uh, nutrients were going to the plant rather than uh, a massive infestation of aphids. So you can see on the left and the right, these plants can get absolutely covered in them. So what are you going to do about them? Well, there's something called a lady beetle, which some other people call a ladybug. It's not technically a bug. And their larvae feast on aphids. So you might be thinking, well, how do I get rid of all of the aphids? 
Well, one of the most important things I would say to get out of this bit of the talk is the idea that rather than thinking of these as pests that you have to 100% eliminate, think of your, your, your garden as an ecosystem where there is a, an interdependence between the different parts of the food chain. And an aphid, although it's, you know, it's unsightly and it eats plants and you know, you'd rather it wasn't there, they actually provide food for these beneficial insects like lady beetles. So you don't necessarily want to completely eliminate them. They will provide food uh, for other parts of the, the, the ecosystem. So on the right, you can see the uh, rather colorful larva of a lady beetle. That's pretty zoomed in. So what are these beneficial insects? Well, we're all familiar with pollinators, not just the honeybee, but also all the native bees, of which there are a couple of hundred, at least in California. And even things like wasps uh, that we would think, oh goodness, we've got to spray those right away. Wasps are actually great, are uh, beneficial insects in some ways. So one of, the, one of the easiest ways of attracting these beneficial insects is growing these tiny flowers. And there are flowers even on vegetables. So for example, if you had 10 carrot plants, you might eat nine of them and then leave one to continue growing. And when it blooms, it will attract all sorts of beneficial insects. It's really, really quite amazing to see what, what, can, what can come out of even just vegetables. So here's the integrated pest management site that I promised called IPM. And so the idea of integrated pest management is the, the sort of the circular idea of a feedback system in, in, an, in an ecosystem. And we're not trying to go in and blast animals and pests and weeds with huge amounts of toxic chemicals. We're looking at what is feeding the pests and what feeds on the pests and how can we structure our environment to minimize pests and at the same time benefiting these beneficial insects who in a sense are our, our kind of allies in, in the garden. So this is an absolutely amazing site and we're gonna have a homework on it. So, during, during your uh, scavenger hunt, head on over to ipm.ucnr.edu and see if you can find this list of goodies. So, what plant do aphids eat? And I can tell you that there is a connection with monarch butterflies. Uh, so here we have number two is a natural insect enemy of aphids. We've kind of talked about that already. Maybe you can find another one. How do you control snails and slugs? We've also talked about that, but the IPM site goes into a lot more detail. So anyway, I'll uh, leave this list there for you to go and search around. Uh, this is probably going to be one of the most useful long-term sites that uh, you can use in your gardening adventure. Thank you very much for, for coming. I'm going to hand over to Anne to take it home. Unmute myself. Hello. So now we are going to have some questions and answers. And... Um, I will start with a question about weed barriers that uh, someone asked. And um, let's see, maybe I'll ask you, Louise. Um, would you recommend, what would you recommend for a weed barrier? For a weed barrier, um, generally, we don't like to recommend plastic landscape cloth because it persists in the environment for a long time and it has a tendency to look really ugly after a while because the edges come up from underneath the mulch and it just it's just kind of icky. Um, 
the best weed barrier, I think that all master gardeners would say is a, a thick layer of organic mulch, such as wood chips or something like that. An inorganic mulch like gravel is also um, a good weed barrier if you are in an area that's prone to fire. Um, again, mulch doesn't completely prevent weeds from growing, but as Paul said, it it it's lighter generally than the soil and it's easier to pull the weeds out of the mulch. So it just makes your life a lot easier. Some people use cardboard as a weed barrier underneath a thick layer of mulch. And if it's an area that's getting a reasonably regular water, the cardboard will decay in a year or two. Um, and it can be an effective weed barrier also. Louise, what about uh, the fabric weed barrier? Well, the fabric is generally made out of plastic. Landscape wow. fabric is plastic, so I, personally, I don't, I don't recommend it. I, I, or I don't, I, I don't like it, and I wouldn't recommend it. A lot of landscape installers would, <laughs> would love to put in. You know, they'd like to put that landscape fabric over the entire garden and. Um, I, I personally don't think that it's a great idea it because it's plastic and because it will persist in the environment. Um, the other thing is that a, a, a barrier, a landscape barrier like that, it doesn't completely prevent the weeds because the one, the first year, the weeds will not be able to come up from underneath. But in subsequent years, weed seeds are going to fall down on top of the mulch or whatever's on top of the landscape fabric, and the weeds are just going to grow and poke their roots right down through. And then you just have a headache because you have a lot of weeds growing down through the fabric and it's it becomes a very difficult situation uh, and a tangle. So again, a thick layer of organic mulch is uh, probably what our, uh, our recommendation would be. Um, I just saw something in the chat about newspaper. Yeah. Newsprint does make a really good weed barrier. It doesn't last for very long, but it's fabulous you, if you can get newsprint. <laughs> Um, yeah, like a thick layer, several sheets, you know, 10 or 10 or 12 sheets even underneath um, makes a great, great weed barrier for a short, short amount of seasons. Yeah. Yes, I, I just want to mention that that's what we used when we um, got rid of our lawn. We used um, many layers of newspaper. We saved mm -hmm. quite a few months. And then someone asked about burlap too. Yeah, yeah, burlap probably would be... Hmm. Burlap's pretty porous. Um, I don't, I would think of burlap as kind of like a mulch. Uh, mostly burlap is used as an erosion control, uh, not so much a wheat barrier. Yeah, I think we used to, I remember this more from my childhood than now, but people use burlap to put on top of newly planted beds to kind of provide the, the some moisture. But, um, and that was a, sort of like we use, um, what are some, well, we have, we have uh, fabrics now that we use for that, but yeah, it does let through a lot of, a lot of moisture and a lot of sunshine. So things would just grow up for it. In my experience, I've never used weed barrier. I've planted yeah. in some pretty hostile environments. Yeah. Um, I had a backyard that was 10,000 square feet of crabgrass. It had been there for decades and didn't use a weed, didn't use a weed barrier. I think mulch is really, really the magic product for uh, for gardening. It really is effective. Yeah, there's people are asking in the chat about where to get it, and I know somebody else has has given some suggestions. Do do any of you have? Um, I'll just throw that out to anyone. Have favorite places you get mulch? I mean, you can get it from a, a tree. Yeah, that's what we've gotten it. <laughs> I say one, one of, yeah, one of my pet peeves is people using leaf blowers. Uh, they're, they're a scourge of the suburban life. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, you can look up uh, soil vendors in the local area. There's a couple of them that will sell soil and various types of uh, tree bark in various configurations from the very fine kind of so-called gorilla hair down to the big uh, big chunks of chunks of bark. Yes. Uh, those are both very effective. The gorilla hair actually is particularly effective if you have a 
if you're on a slope because it, it holds together it doesn't tend to to roll down and it's very very easy to pull weeds out of well i also noticed some cities give away uh, free compost or mulch i know yes. those, not those hills and i realize and i understand that because i don't live there but i ride my bike by there and they have a big sign that it's free for los altos hills residents but anyway so other cities probably do have something similar the Sunnyvale Smart Station, um, not always, but sometimes has a, a chip mulch pile along with their compost pile. So you can get free chip mulch or free compost from there if you live in those cities. I've noticed that when people are putting down mulch, and I've noticed this when landscapers are doing it, they do not put down enough mulch. I mean, for it to be an effective weed barrier, you have to have three to four inches of mulch. Yes. That's what we're talking about when we say a thick layer, three to four inches. Mm -hmm. And I, I would encourage anybody, if, you're, if you have a tree that needs to be cut down, to have, to have it uh, chipped and keep the chips to use for your yard. Yeah. We've done that with several trees. And yeah. there's a question here about Chinese pistache dropping berries. I, I believe that the berries would be, they would be, they're essentially, they've got seeds in them. So it's probably, uh, so they're asking if the berries would sprout in the garden, if they use them as part of the leaf mulch. I'm guessing they might. What do you think, Susan? I see. They might <laughs> sprout. Anything that's got a seed in it has the yeah. has life in it. It's going to be looking for soil. And yes. once it gets its, uh, finds it, there's soil down there, get some water, going to sprout. Yeah. yeah, you may have, those of you who have privet trees in the neighborhood might notice that they're getting little privet trees coming up all over and their berries are distributed by birds often. And, and I think that might be true of any, any berry. Yeah. And, and I see there's a question about the rotor tilling. Yes. And I know yes. Paul don't. talked about the seed banks and, and the thing that I think we encourage these days is not to do a lot of rotor tilling. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to it uh, destroys some of the bio, the bioorganisms and, and the soil web down there, but it will also stir up the seed banks, the weed banks actually that are down there. So there's, there's lots of weed seeds down there just waiting to be rotor tilled and waiting to come up to the surface. So there are various reasons why you don't want to rotor till and one of them is you're going to bring up the weed banks as, as well as um, destroying some of the microorganisms in there. Then there's a question about are there any downsides to using gravel uh, versus mulch? I guess they mean like using gravel as mulch rather than an organic matter. Um, I, I have been struggling with that myself uh, recently because I live in an area that's very fire prone and I would love to put wood chip mulch all over my garden, but I can't, it's, it's too dangerous. So I am thinking I will put gra more gravel in certain places or, or something like decomposed granite, uh, which is like a very fine gravel. Um, for, especially for native plants, gravel and, and that kind of thing can be a really, really wonderful uh, mulch. Um, in a, in a vegetable garden, I would definitely not use gravel uh, because it, it just makes the soil, it'll be heavy on top of your plants. So it kind of depends on your situation. Mm -hmm. uh, the, in connection with fire, I know there was somebody who, who uh, when we were talking about rosemary, or Susan was talking about rosemary, asked whether rosemary um, wasn't sus a fire susceptible plant. Uh, beans kind of dry and woody. And All I, plants will burn. Anything yeah. will burn. <laughs> you know, so. I, I, I believe there, are, I don't have the, the link with me, but there is like a California fire safe landscaping sites that will give you some list of which are the worst ones as far as, um, as far as yeah. the ability to fire. And I know that there are certain there is there are certain rules about landscaping if you're in a fireproof area, such as um, uh, not as Louisa suggested, not using um, bark mulch and other rules. You just just do a search for that, and you'll find information. 
then we have some more things, uh, questions about weeds. And um, uh, somebody's asking about 30% vinegar solution. And uh, does anybody, uh, do you have an opinion about that? <laughs> Louise, you're making. I see. You. I'll let somebody else talk first if they, if they want to choose if they want to answer that question. But if let's just say, just don't believe everything you read online. Yes, <laughs> I I don't think it'd be good for the soil to apply so much vinegar to it. Um, I have a neighbor who used the hot water technique for a while. Well, that um, he had boiling hot water and he'd go out there and pour it on a particular weed and you no. Know, you know, after a while, it did kill the weed. It was very, very labor intensive. Yeah. Yeah. And I wouldn't think it would necessarily kill the roots. So you might have to keep repeating it. Well, he did. He went back out there several times. Okay. For um, a span of many weeks. Horticultural vinegar is um, 20 to 30% and you can buy it in a hardware store um, and it's it's an herbicide. Don't kid yourself that it's any less dangerous or damaging than any other herbicide. Um, I, I, view, I use herbicides myself sometimes in specific situations so I'm, I'm not against them per se but don't kid yourself that vinegar is better. <laughs> um, it's it's not, and the kind of vinegar that you use from your kitchen is ineffective. So if you want to use an herbicide, you should choose one um, that's sold as an herbicide and that has all the instructions on the label that you can follow so that you can use it safely and effectively. I would, I would also add to that, as someone that's um, used these stronger vinegars, it, it's really it's really easy to think oh yeah you know it's vinegar it's just like what i put on my fries um this stuff is dangerous like if you splash that in your eyes or you get it on your hands um it can be big trouble mm -hmm. so tread lightly with with that i i, I did, just don't think it's very effective I you only you'll see other things about mixing epsom salt and other things but it's just it's total nonsense hogwash <laughs> <laughs> A lot of hogwash out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's there was a question back here. One more question that the rototiller brought up. You, the, what is the what is the alternative to rototilling? Well, actually, Paul is going to give us the tool for that next week. It's the oh, yeah. spreading yeah. fork, right? Just, huh? that, that's just week, that's yeah. just a tease for next week. Here, you have to come and and, and, and get that answer. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about rotisilin quickly. So I have a I have a big Honda gas powered rotisilla, and there are times when these things are actually pretty useful. So, for example, I I my one of my yards has a has a is on a slope, and to terrace it, we ended up simultaneously cutting soil out and then adding it further down to make a series of steps. And when, when you take up that topsoil, you're ending up underneath with hard packed clay. And it's very, very difficult to do anything with that. So that was a good example, I think, where using a rototiller is useful because then uh, you can dig into that hard packed clay and then amend it with compost and other organic material that turns it into, that kind of jump starts it into a living, a living system. So there's an example of a rototiller, but generally, I would say try not to use it. They, uh, I mean, if you think of this, if you think of soil as um, kind of like the skin over a, in in a in, in a body, you know, if you, you're abrading it, you're you're mixing up different layers that are serving different purposes, um, and mixing it all up. It's it's not it's not just kind of an undifferentiated mass of dirt. Each of these layers has Different purposes within, um, within within the the kind of the ecosystem of the soil. It's a lot more complex than it, than it sounds. Um, than than it just appears by looking at this um, pile of matter. So, I would I would avoid it. One of the things you can research if you're interested is is the no till movement, and they talk a lot about that. And you'll learn about techniques like double digging and using a fork and things like that. Um, so hopefully that. That gives you a bit of insight. 
I wanted to actually add a, a quick tip. If you do buy mulch, so we're kind of going back to the mulch thing, they sell it by a yard and a yard is uh, a cubic yard. So one yard by one yard by one yard. This is quite a lot of matter. And you might be thinking, okay, so I've got my, I've got my, my, my space, how do, I, how do I cover it? If you want to cover at about three inches, each cubic yard will cover about 12 square yards. So imagine you've got space three yards by four yards, that's 12 square yards. Um, one cubic yard will cover that to a depth of about three inches. If you want a depth of four inches, then it's about nine, nine square yards. That's just kind of a handy rule of thumb when you go to these places, because they're going to ask you how many yards do you want. That's very helpful. Yeah, I think there's calculators too on that. Yeah, you can you, yes. you can go online and type in these numbers, but just as a as a rule of thumb, it's about you you can think of it as about ten square yards per per cubic yard. Will give you a pretty nice solid layer of mulch. I, I think what's being, as far as rotor tilling goes, I think what's being discouraged now is to think of it as part of your annual routine, as people used to do. It used to be like a springtime thing. People would rotor till their garden. And now I think rotor tillers are used primarily, as Paul mentioned, in establishing a new garden or, you know, digging it. But, but it's not something you need to do year after year. Yeah, it's a one-time thing usually. Right. Um, here's a question about soil too. What is the percentage soil compost? I guess that means they probably mean how much compost, what percentage of compost, like, or maybe, maybe I think an easier way to think of it might be how many inches of compost would you work into the soil? Can one of you answer that? You know, just kind of depends. Uh, depends on whether you've got soil that you've been amending and working with for years, or if it's soil that's never had any compost applied. So, um, like if I was starting a brand new vegetable garden in some random Santa Clara County soil that had never been vegetable gardened, I'd I'd put six inches on top of that before I even you know of compost mm -hmm. to start with. Um, but over the years, as you work, as you compost and compost more and more, um, then you don't need to add so much. So really well, uh, well amended soil after let's say 10 years of, of good treatment, you might add a thin layer of compost a couple times a year, like an inch. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're really planning ahead, you would put in a cover crop before the spring vegetables and, uh, and then dig that in, be it fava beans or hairy vetch or all sorts of different cover crops, because that's, that's good for the soil too. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good thing to research, cover crops. Yes. And there's a question here that I, get, I confess, I um, have never heard of this before. Maybe some of you have. Any thoughts on hill culture, hugel culture? Does that work well? And is it true urine can be used as a fertilizer? <laughs> yes, yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can you explain Hugo culture briefly? Uh, Paul, maybe. Yeah, it's it's an idea where you essentially cover compost in in a layer of a, a denser layer mm -hmm. and just leave it. Mm -hmm. Oh and yeah. And it breaks it breaks down, kind of protects it by this this outer dense layer. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think there's a there's a demonstration garden somewhere in Berkeley, because of course it's Berkeley, uh, that is run by uh, urine. Really? So all the fertilization is is entirely urine. <laughs> like, I mean, if look up uric acid, it's, it's got tons of nitrogen in it, in it. Yeah, yeah. If you if you actually wanted to experiment with this, um, you can uh, take dry leaves mulch them with one of those uh, vacuums, you know, the, the mulching vacuum, and uh, use it as your outdoor urine toilet. It works. <laughs> so I've heard. Thank you, I'm not, not going to take a note on that one, Paul. <laughs> we'll just leave it like that. Don't, don't let your neighbors catch you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you may have to register after that one. But. <laughs> 
So then we, we have a question here on, on a different topic. Do you know <laughs> drought tolerant ground covers, do it keep weeds down in a curb strip that doesn't get much water? No, for that, would that Calscape uh, uh, website be a good one for that? Or to look up at something that, that is a good ground cover and is also drought tolerant? I know. Um, yeah, you could you could Google or search literally that exactly what you just said. You know, I, ground cover for drought tolerant ground cover for a parking strip, and you'd probably get some pretty good ideas right there. Um, you want something that's really low. Um, I'm thinking of things like Cotone Aster or or. Um, Ice plant, I've seen ice plant suppresses weeds. I don't love ice plant, but it does suppress weeds pretty well because it grows pretty dense. Just don't plant ivy, please. One, one thing, uh, one idea I have is to go walk around your neighborhood and take a picture of the ground cover on a curb strip that you really like and then go to a nursery and and uh, say, you just show them the photo and uh, they'll probably be able to sell you the plant. Uh, to certainly identify it. Right, this is when a good nursery interview will really yeah. be helpful. Right, but I always find it, one of the things I like when I walk in my neighborhood is to see what's growing well, because I figure they have the same soil conditions as I do. So, um, so, so all po the problem with leaf mulch, they're saying, is that cats in the neighborhood use it. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Does anybody have a suggestion with respect to that? I, that's what cats love. <laughs> I know some people put, I, I've heard of some people when the cats are getting to, into their vegetable beds, they'll put um, like some rose trimmings around that have thorns in it and stuff. But uh, that's not, you know, that, that you would only use that in certain circumstances. Let's see. Oh, there are questions about cover crops. Do we cover that next next week? I don't. I'm not so sure, but I, I did see the question, and, and yeah. I, I guess I've experienced that as a mistake in the past. I'll get the cover crop, and I will dig it in. What what you what they say is you you cut it off at the level. You leave the roots in. You get the foliage up above, and then you dig it in. But the problem is it's it's going to use nitrogen in the soil to, to decompose. And if you put plants in right in front on top of that, uh, they won't do well. Mm -hmm. So what they recommend is when you're digging in the, the cover crop, you know, leave a month or six weeks or even two months to make sure the process of decomposing is completed. And then you can put something on top of that. So you have to be careful. I know what, what some people do too, if you don't have all that time, you take your cover crops and put them in your compost and let them decay yeah. in your compost right. when they, let's, let's see, according to message. We have, uh, oh, there are more, more things about cats. Uh, yeah. My neighborhood, my neighborhood has coyotes, so I, I don't see. <laughs> Keep your cats indoors, yes. Oh, okay. Good idea. Yeah, keep your cats indoors. Yep. Definitely. Um, oh, they, there are some suggestions about that. And then, um, sorry, I'm trying to get beyond the cat message ones. <laughs> um, effective ways, what are some effective ways to remove weeds from lawn? There's the hori hori. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Dig it out. Digging them. Dig them out. Yeah. You're going to see the uh, what a hori hori is next week. It's it's the best digger. I would say get rid of your lawn. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, you're probably all thinking that. <laughs> and here's uh, someone asking about um, a method I've seen too. Have you ever heard of putting plastic milk jugs in bottom of a deep pot? And then soil on top and plants planted in that to prevent having a heavy pot with all soil. 
I okay. think you need to get a smaller pot. I yeah. I, uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what some people use. I, I thought when I saw the milk jug, they were going to go to it. Some people use them to water their plants somehow. Right. Yeah. I have seen that on on YouTube or somewhere like like a half barrel where the person took a bunch of the one I saw was a bunch of empty like soda cans and just they they literally threw like 40 soda cans in the bottom of the barrel and then put their soil on top of that and then planted their plants mm -hmm. and I, I it won't hurt the plants I don't think no no you wouldn't want to keep a plant that's going to have a well-developed root structure in a pot that's got cans at the bottom. No. Yeah, here's, here's maybe for annuals. Maybe for your annuals, if you're going to raise your radish seeds or something like that in there, but not for a plant that you're going to keep in that container. Yeah, somebody mentions here that they they the kind of method that we've described where you where you you fill um a pot with something other than soil is good when you want to use a large pot for aesthetic reasons, but you don't need that. You sure. don't need that much soil for the plant. Well, the other thing they used to say, put rocks on the bottom, and that's not a good thing because that yes, that that, that means that the, the the water stops at that point where the rocks are, so it doesn't do too much for drainage. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Can you explain a little more about that? Because I thought that that's something we all used to learn about putting. Well, we all thought you know intuitive rocks. Okay, so it'll it'll help encourage the drainage, but the physics, I think, as I understand it. The water drains to the uh, through the soil. When it gets to the rocks, it stops and sort of puddles. Mm -hmm. And and roots don't like to be in puddles, so that's yeah. not a good idea. Yeah, maybe somebody has a little more science than that. But no, that that maybe. sounds like it. I but it was it was a real um, it was very interesting when I learned it because I'd always been told the opposite. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Oh, there's a question about um, what they ask, what trees are good for mulch? Are some acidic? Um, I, I, I think you can use any tree for mulch. Is that, is that what you, I know sometimes people have worried about. Um, are the oleanders? Yeah, I don't know. No, I think oleanders are okay. I, I, because the, plant, the plants themselves, I think are a little bit dangerous or poisonous. Right. But, I'm sh I was told that that's okay to compost it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, there's a new message here. Tree leaves, Ray Mulch question. Um, asking about tree leaves as mulch. Maybe I'm not. I think I, I'm getting the sense that the basic idea is, is there some things that we shouldn't use as mulch, like certain kinds of trees or certain kinds yes, of leaves? Yes, yeah. yeah. My, my understanding is pretty much you can use any organic um, bark or tree tree um, chippings or leaves, oak leaves, pine pine needles make great mulch. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the mythol, a lot of the the stuff that says don't use oak tree leaves because they're such and such is has really been shown to be mythology. Um, Paul might have more insight on that, or somebody else might. Yeah, that I I agree with you, Louise. I think I might avoid something like a magnolia tree leaf unless I was able to grind it up because oh, yeah. they do not break down, and they would they would actually build a layer that would not allow water to penetrate. The only that's, thing that's I a good you point. can't do is palm trees. Palm trees ah. you don't want to mulch those. Mm -hmm. What if you shredded it though? I'm not even sure that because I know that some cities don't even take palm trees in there. They mm -hmm. don't want you to put the leaves of the fawns in the uh, in the in the bins. The question: I'm sure pine tree mulch is is fine. Yes. And eucalyptus leaves too, I think, as long as mm -hmm. they're, yeah. The mm -hmm. only thing, like I was, Susan had mentioned magnolia leaves, and I think their problem is they are so thick that it's yeah. that. Uh, the rain doesn't always get through them easily, but that could be taken care of by putting them through a shredder. Yeah. I think there's some um, some misconceptions about oak leaves and possibly eucalyptus leaves too. 
Mm -hmm. um, people think that they are bad for mulching with because you don't see things growing under oak trees and under eucalyptus trees very much. Mm -hmm. But generally the reason things don't grow under trees is not because of the leaves falling on the ground. It's because there's no sunlight. Yeah. It's not So the mulch, the mulch is, um, they're fine for mulch. Mm -hmm. I was once told that the, uh, the bark of the eucalyptus doesn't, doesn't compost because it's got toxins and other mm. um, ill-defined things in them. Uh, so I tried it and I chipped probably two or three yards of eucalyptus bark and I mixed it with some pomace, which is the leftover from winemaking. And it does indeed compost. We got we had a hundred and hundred and eighty degree compost pile. It was so hot you couldn't even touch it. Uh, so it definitely does compost. Cool. I got a fun fact about the city of San Jose. The palm tree is one of the few species that doesn't require a permit to remove. Oh. <laughs> they've, they've deemed it of such minimal ecological value. It doesn't provide shade. It consumes tons of water. Yeah. Um, they're, they're happy to for you to get rid of it. But they do have the eucalyptus require. trees also? Uh, eucalyptus trees do require permits. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, because I'd like to get rid of one. But... Palm trees it, don't it. fall under heritage tree law. No, there's, there's, there's nothing valuable about palm tree, okay. hmm. ecologically. Well, I think we've reached the end of our, our questions here. Um, and thank you very much for joining us. And uh, um, you could find, um, I'm sorry, some of you seemed from your comments earlier, didn't seem to get the uh, reminder email they sent, but uh, I would just, all I can say is look in your spam folder. Um, and uh, in the reminder email, I did mention that you can now see uh, the handouts from previous classes and the, uh, a PDF of the slides in our handouts page on our public website. And also we are putting these classes up on YouTube and uh, the, what, this one today's will be up probably midweek next week. And the first two are already up there. So um, happy watching and uh, we'll see you next week.